We got a bunch of angry Buckeyes out there, I'm sure. A bunch of angry Big Teners overall. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, brings you Ohio State football talk each and every week, courtesy of these guys. Got Kevin Noon on the top from uh, Buckeye Grove. We got uh, Steve Hellwagon from uh, 247 Sports, Bucknuts, and also Buckeye Scoops, Tony Gerdeman. Guys, dare I ask, dare I ask, how we doing? <laughs> Not good, Bob. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to get to watch a lot of SCC, ACC and uh, Big 12 football because, you know, my my Saturdays for the fall have, have remained clear. The good news is we may not be able to watch college football in Columbus, but we can watch uh, a peewee, um, JV, uh, varsity, Pop Warner, e everything else, um, NFL, but no. No college in Columbus. Where does you, where does University of Cincinnati fit on there? Are they are you calling them Pee Wee or or, uh, or JV? JV ish. <laughs> Those uh, checklists are out there on Twitter. Check green checks on down the line. A lot of football teams, a lot of football leagues playing. Oh, no Ohio State football, Pennsylvania and Ohio. So. We know what the decision was originally. We know what the backlash has been. Now, certainly in the Big Ten, and specifically at Ohio State, probably more than any other program, there's been an organized backlash um, to say we demand answers. We demand reconsideration. We demand transparency. Um, Steve, we'll start with you. Just in regards to what you see and the probabilities of this thing getting turned around, it would be a huge PR nightmare, or it already is a big, huge PR nightmare. Uh, but a lot of people don't like to look bad in terms of, oh, we made a wrong decision. Uh, one of the fallacies of a lot of leadership out there in regards to, hey, can we just say, we screwed up? And we're going to give this a go now. But um, Steve, um, your your thoughts about where we stand on all this? Yeah, there's been a lot of reporting and a lot of information and misinformation, I guess, that's kind of come and gone uh, here this week about uh, people possibly working behind the scenes to get five or six of the 14 Big Ten schools together to play in the fall, in regardless of what uh, the commissioner laid out last week. Uh, that it would be quote unquote postponed. And so um, things were coming to a head. You had the parents of five of the schools sending letters. Uh, Randy Wade, the father of uh, Sean Wade, <clears throat> promising to lead a uh, parent march on the Big Ten headquarters on Friday morning at 8 a.m. Central Time. And you could just kind of see that things were starting to come to a head. There had been reports out there that Gene Smith was working behind the scenes to still get a fall season of some sort. And I just think that finally uh, Kevin Warren, you know, came out from his, his hole that he's been in for eight days and finally decided, I need to address this and I need every one of you, Gene Smith, and everyone else to address this as well and clarify our position, which is that there was a vote and it was overwhelmingly in support of postponing the fall season. And um, that's where we're going to go as a group, 14 strong. And uh, Gene Smith seemed to kind of back that as well. Uh, he had uh, refuted the Jeff Snook report that he'd been working behind the scenes in a conversation with Clay Hall, a television reporter here in Columbus, uh, either by, by text or I presume it was by text, he uh, refuted the report that uh, he'd been working behind the scenes. What's unclear is whether he actually was working behind the scenes, and by that point it had been completely put to bed for the last time that it wasn't going to happen. Um, I guess we, we don't know, and I'm sure somebody will uh, get a uh, – the smell the or uh, – Somebody is going to get to the bottom of this at some point and uh, publish all the news that's not fit to print. But uh, as it stands right now, no fall football for the Big Ten, and they are hoping to uh, stage something in the winter. But again, uh, first of all, do we know that uh, the climate will be uh, better 
uh, in January, February than it is now in terms of COVID. Uh, no mention about myocarditis, I don't think, in his letter, by the way. So was that a big factor or not? I, I don't recall reading it in his letter. Maybe I'll have to go back through it. It kind of gave me a headache as I got to about the fourth bullet point, fourth needless bullet point. Um, and uh, is this really like a JV, like, exhibition showcase season or is this going to be real college football because what are they playing for we don't even know that the pac-12 can stage this with los angeles such a hot spot we don't even know if uh, if the pac-12 in seattle and portland as well the disaster that they're in uh can they even stage this will there be a pac-12 champion at the end to play in a in a pie in the sky rose bowl on april 15 on tax day I mean, Jesus criminy. I don't know. I'm so disgusted by the whole thing. And uh, they took 130 years of tradition and flushed it straight down the toilet. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm taking a hard line against what they've done here. But, um, you know, if the ACC and the SEC and the Big 12 pull this off, declare a national champion, give Sunshine the Heisman Trophy that should have had uh, – Justin Fields' name written on it. You know what? What can you say? I mean, they they've ruined all of our adult lives. I think I don't know. That is that too much to say? We'll take it, Steve. A lot of people feel the same way, and it was nice and clean. So <laughs> a lot of people wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have been so eloquent. So Kevin, thank you. You've got the floor. Maybe Kevin will be one of them. You know, I, I went to Twitter a couple minutes ago and said it was even money that I would say naughty words. I'm going to do my best not to. But uh, it really just shows a lack of leadership in the Big Ten. This letter that they put out eight days after the fact could have, could have, would have, should have accompanied anything that came out. Kevin Warren had every opportunity to answer the questions that Dave Revson asked him on the Big Ten show. We go through all this time. We get a regurgitated piece of crap letter that has half of the stuff from that was just taken from the Pac-12 note. There's no real direction in there other than, no, you're wrong. We had a vote. It was strongly, you know, overwhelmingly in favor of this. It, 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 it seriously, I, I, I feel stupider after reading the letter, and I feel stupider after having any faith in the Big Ten trying to solve this. You would have figured with all the time that they put in going radio silent at this point, Kevin Warren sitting in front of his wall of Warren, which probably isn't even at the Big Ten offices. So Randy Wade is going to be with the other parents is going to be protesting in front of the secretary. And I'll be there to watch it, of course, because that's what I do. Um, it's 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 just it's it's ridiculous. It's mind numbing the lack of leadership that has gone on at this point. It has been a pass the buck type of situation. Nobody wants their fingers on the hot potato. Oh, it's Warren. Oh, it's the presidents and the chancellors. Oh, it's the ADs. Everybody is complicit in this at this point. There are certain people that I do believe through this process that we're fighting for. We're not even saying fighting to play football immediately. Let's just play the first week, you know. September 3rd, Ohio State at Illinois. Let's kick the can down the road for a couple of weeks and see what's happening. Let's figure out what's happening here. There's a lot of conflicting information on this heart swelling situation. You have doctors at Michigan and other places, and you know, a very renowned doctor in Tel Aviv who said that the study that was being used was was severely flawed. But it just really feels to me that Kevin Warren and a certain group of presidents and chancellors that aren't that committed to football and probably don't have much of a football product to present had made up their mind a long time ago. And in a real disappointing move, I want the other three power three power five leagues to play because I want the Big Ten to have to wear this. I want them to have to own this. I want them to have to have this out there forever for there to be this bogus three conference champion. So we use this as a cautionary tale to see what a joke Kevin Warren is. I support Kevin Warren and everything he's done. Next question. Now uh, I, it is interesting that so many of the letters of the, from the parents 
were asking for a reply by August 19th. Today being August 19th, and he finally drops a reply. And as Kevin or Steve said, you know, that was the same reply he could have given the day that the decision was made. And we've waited eight days for anything. And so we finally get something. What is interesting to me is, is the way the Big Ten is seemingly, and I don't know if the, the rest of the, the teams in the Big Ten have done this. I assume they will be or have been, but the, the circling of the wagons. Immediately after Kevin Warren re- releases his statement, Gene Smith releases his statement. And it, I, I'm wondering if in these meetings there was this come to Jesus where it's like, we are the Big Ten. We are renowned for being in line with each other. We need to get back to that immediately. And so you see Gene Smith come out and and his statement, thanking all of the fans for everything, but that, you know, we're going to pursue winter football. The, uh, The president of OSU saying that there may be still some fall sports by the end of the fall, but I still go back to the NCAA's chief medical officer, what, two months ago, saying it makes no sense to move football out of the fall because you don't know any more about what January, February, March, April, May is going to look like than you do now. And right now you are prepared for now. And as Gene Smith said in his statement, we could play immediately. We could hold competitions immediately because they believe they have done everything they need to do to keep people safe and to have an environment that would succeed in this mess that we have now. And so it's, it was interesting to me that yes, we're not going to pursue any, any more fall football. I believe it is the fourth time Gene Smith has had to say this in the span of a week. So maybe tomorrow he'll say it for a fifth time, no fall football. And they are pursuing winter football, but it was interesting to me at least that he said, but we could, if we want like if we were able to, we totally could. And it's kind of like, well, you know, you are able to. You're, you're just not going to because of all of the, the the millions of, of reasons that living with the Big Ten ha, has brought you. But all in all, I'm I'm with everybody else. You know, I, I wonder what Buckeye fans feel like. Do they want all of the other uh, programs to be shut down in terms of the the other conferences so that there's no football and Ohio State doesn't fall behind, or us all being co- college football people? Do you still want you got you you got to want college football, right? So you have something to watch. Do you want college football more than you want to see Ohio State like, on the sideline? I still, as I said last show, I don't think Ohio State will fall off the face of the earth for this. But um, I, I do wonder how badly, like, like what, where is that poll? And I'll probably put that out on Twitter. Like, where are they? Do they do they not want any football, or do they want football because you don't want to go an entire year without college football? Okay, there is. Yeah, so are they actually even calling it a winter season? Has that been the um, has that been the transformation of terms because it's been backed up into December and then a January football schedule? I've the latest rumor that I've heard, and God knows we're, we've all been. Well, I haven't, but a lot of people have been following somebody named Boat Boy or Sir Yacht or some crap like that on Twitter, and all the rumors. And he he went down with the ship, and I guess <laughs> I'll go down with is that I've heard starts the season will be eight games, starts the first week of January. You'll play eight games in nine weeks within three dome stadiums. There will be multiple games per venue as it goes on, and then it would lead into potentially a bowl game or bowl games, plural. You know, I think the hope would be the Pac-12 doing something in unison leading to a Rose Bowl. But, again, that that's what I've heard can't really corroborate it. Uh, you know, Gene Smith is already having to deal with talking about other rumors out there. I haven't really gone to him about it, but that seems to be the one. But then you read the letter that goes out today, and they're working on their task force with uh, Ted McGinley and Miss Betty Childs from Revenge of the Nerds trying to figure this thing out. So I don't know. But that's I, I do think that the only way you're going to make this work is you have to go in January, kind of the Ryan Day plan versus the uh, Jeff Braun plan at Purdue, which was going pretty much like the last weekend of February. I think that's the only way that you're not going to impact the 2021 season too severely is if you get this done and you get some more separation where these uh, athletes are able to have a little bit of time to, to recoup. Well, <clears throat> I, 
I'll throw in, uh, Kevin talked about the March on Rosemont on uh, Friday and Kevin Warren not being there. There's no sports. There's no reason for anybody to be there. Not even the freaking janitor should be there on Friday. I mean, there's no reason for any of those people to be there on Friday. Um, that's my, my first thing. Um, you know, them staging a football season in late January to March uh, makes you wonder how much goodwill they're going to engender with the other conferences if they're going up against the the something called the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament, which brings in a ton of revenue uh, for all the membership. If they're having football games up against that, and, of course, uh, their networks, uh, what would it be? ESPN, Fox, uh, ABC, uh, Big Ten Network. They don't cover any NCAA tournaments. I mean, ESPN's got the women's tournament, which is nothing to speak of, obviously. So uh, their networks are probably like, sure, bring it on. Uh, great uh, winter spring programming, I guess. Um, but uh, that, that's probably an ancillary thought to all this whole thing. I just... I, this, you, I equated this to the Jerry Sandusky thing and the Minnesota massacre, the basketball thing from 1972 as one of the darkest moments in big 10 history. And people took me to task that you really can't compare the Sandusky thing to anything because nothing really compares to that. But this is a moment, a watershed moment in time that is going to haunt the big 10 in my opinion forever. And, um, whether it creates a rift down the middle between the haves who produce all the revenue and the have nots who are just brought along for the ride for scheduling uh, uh, the availability of scheduling, for lack of a better term, and TV homes uh, for an even bigger lack of a better term. Um, you know, they bring nothing to the table. And I mean, I'm looking at you when I'm talking about Rutgers, Maryland, uh, Indiana, Purdue, uh, Illinois, certainly uh, nothing. I mean, Illinois means nothing in Chicago. That's how badly they've killed that brand off that they can't play. A, they played a basketball game with Ohio State and Illinois at the United Center two years ago and were lucky to get about 8,000 people there. And it was like on Illinois' ticket plan, and nobody from Illinois went. So if they don't care about Illinois in Chicago, they don't care about Illinois anywhere. So, you know, I don't know what to say other than this could lead down the line when the new TV deal comes up uh, in the next few years. Uh, it could be a situation where if anybody's on the ball and could pull the football powerhouses together and just tell everybody to go go grip it because they could take the big 10 network with them and tell everybody else, see you later. And, 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 and part of it is you have to think about why didn't that happen in this case, just in this one small sliver of having the football powers play each other in some kind of a makeshift fall season, maybe a double round Robin. It sounds to me like when push came to shove, you had Iowa, you had Nebraska you had Ohio State, and you probably had Penn State. The first break today was when Franklin came out first thing this morning and said, eh, doesn't look like fall's going to happen. That was the that was when the first shoe dropped, and uh, the people in that little cabal, those four schools in particular, finally got it through their thick heads that they'd been defeated. And what that tells me is they couldn't get Michigan or they couldn't get Wisconsin uh, to go along with them. So – I, uh, you know, I, that's my feeling, uh, is that even, even when they tried to break off, it, it couldn't be a clean break because, uh, they had, uh, Michigan's president, I guess, is a doctor and wanted no part of it. Michigan state's president is an infectious disease doctor, I guess, and wanted no part of it. Uh, Wisconsin, I was told, um, certainly Barry Alvarez and, uh, Paul Blart, the coach would have wanted it. But uh, their administration and their community in Madison is very uh, liberal, and I'm not taking any political sides or anything about it. 
it would just been a hard thing to push through. He said it's so bad in Madison that the schools there uh, can't use their lights to play Friday night football games. A lot of times people complain about it. And you would think in a football crazy town that or state that they wouldn't have that kind of a problem, but they do. So what we view as a football crazy place, you know, there's other factions involved. And in this case, those factions uh, won out. So, you know, um, I, I don't know what else. Again, I, I come to the end of this thing and I'm just disgusted by the whole thing. And uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I'll am i throw it back. And if I've got something more, I'll jump in. But I'm just uh, that that to me uh, frustrated by how we got to this point. All the stops, the starts, his pathetic handling of this situation his pathetic inability to be transparent, his pathetic inability to answer a straight question. Even that sports business journal thing, John Orand, or however you pronounce it, threw him a softball at about five miles per hour, and he couldn't answer that, and then got into this thing. Well, we've got 14 colleges with 14 disparate ways of looking at life, and certainly there's going to be disagreements, and blah, 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 but that's what makes us great. Didn't answer the freaking question, not one bit, not one time, hasn't yet, probably never will. I kind of want to jump in here with just the fact that the deck was always stacked against football happening. Because what happens, let's just play, you know, let's take it at face value that a vote happened or whatever. What if it were 8 6 to play football? Would the six teams that voted not to play football be like, oh, okay, we'll just go along? Our fears don't mean anything. Or would they have just said, well, up yours, we're not playing or whatever. I don't think there was ever a situation of where this was going to work out per se. And you know what? It's so easy to bag on Rutgers and Maryland or whatever, but they put, you know, it's like, you know, we're trying not to be political, but the whole talk of packing the courts and putting more people on, they diluted the votes and it just got into an even worse situation. And the worst part of it was it is my belief, and until I am told otherwise, I'm not backing off of this, Kevin Warren walked into there fully intending on punting until spring, at best, at best punting until spring. And I was told that the way things kind of went down, it was a systematic beatdown of anybody that stood their way with op opposition. And then by the time that you break the wills of the people that are against you, it's easy to have this overwhelming consensus because you browbeat them. So I, I really think that there were a lot of agendas in play here, and it all starts with the head guy in charge. So, And if there is eight to six want to play, that's not a consensus. So if you don't have a consensus to play, I guess that's a consensus not to play, just by proxy. And then you just build off of that and you talk people out of it and – I, I think that's what, what what has happened. And I do wonder, like, if instead of Rutgers and Maryland, if Jim Delaney had added, say, Texas and Oklahoma, like, what would the vote be there? Do we really think we wouldn't be playing if you added two football programs instead of two East Coast um, entities? Yes. Like, if, if you were worried more about football than footprint, considering, like, what footprint did they actually bring that you didn't already have? But that, that I, you know, that's, I guess neither here nor there. I just think if you would, it would be an interesting vote, a better vote, a um, a, a more uh, football friendly vote if the, they had added two football programs in, instead of Maryland and Rutgers, and then we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in this mess until you know maybe like October when the season gets shut down or something like that. And you know, we'll see. We'll see if, if they can, if everybody else can pull it off. I'm still skeptical of that happening. But I did find it interesting that in Kevin Warren's open letter, he mentioned how the entire time we've been going day by day saying, like, we don't know for sure if we're going to play. We've always been patient. We, we've always been taking it day by day and going and being patient. And then, what, you just you shut it down rather than, than be patient. And so, yeah, you were patient, and everybody's been patient, and then you stop being patient and shut it down, and that's what everybody's had the issue with. Talking Ohio State football each and every week, by extension Big Ten, by extension the nation, and they've never been so connected and disconnected at the same time, disconnected in their decisions, 
but connected in everybody wanting to see college football in its totality with the major five conferences competing for national championship, something we apparently won't see here in the fall of 2020. Maybe by extension, maybe the only thing that comes out of this that is good for the football fan is being able to see big time college football potentially from September all the way to May. But David Cottrell made a point here about the perception of the SEC, the ACC, and the Big 12 playing a legit championship. Is that going to be compromised versus the Big 10 and the Pac-12? I touched upon this last week. I think we all did. Here's my thought. The Big Ten has to hope for a season to become a debacle and there to be no conclusion to an ACC, SEC, and and Big 12 season. Otherwise, they look bad because they start playing football in January and everybody's going to be like, why couldn't you have played with everybody else? Uh, From the perception of a championship and if it's legit process, there are going to be certain people that are going to be like, Oh, Washington State didn't compete. It's not legit to an extreme. But in this, let's let's be reasonable about this. As I stated last week, to the average fan, and it's justified, who matters here? Ohio State, maybe Penn State a little bit, maybe Michigan a little bit, maybe in Oregon a little bit. But basically, Ohio State is the one school, the one team, the one program that everybody looks to across the nation that has a brain uh, concerning college football and says they are our legitimate national championship contender. And we live in a gold medal conscious society. They don't care about the silvers and the bronze. They don't care about the minor bowl games or even uh, sadly about conference championships much anymore. It's about who's going to be in that playoff and who can compete. Well, the thought process, and it's been justified is Ohio state's the only one that's been taken away. All right. I hate to throw these numbers at big 10 fans, um, and it's really not even about the Big Ten. It's being uh, playing poorly on the field. It's about the Big Ten being ex- excluded. So what's what to you guys is more legit? If in 2018, as it were, the SEC, the ACC, the Big 12, and Notre Dame played a college football playoff, excluding the Big Ten and the Pac-12, who actually played a season, and had champions to be selected, and in Ohio State's case, had a very similar, if not a better resume than Oklahoma to say, we're here, but they weren't invited. It's not a playoff system. It's an invitational. They weren't invited. Is that more legit? Or two years later, if those three conferences, plus Notre Dame being in the ACC this year, said, are saying we forfeit. They're basically in essence saying we forfeit. We're not participating. I would think that that's actually more legitimate because they're at least making the decision, the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, we're not participating. In 2018, the decision was made for them. We played a season. We want to participate in the playoff, but we're not allowed. We're not invited. In this situation, well, the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, they're forfeiting their participation. So we're playing a championship. And then you look at the numbers that have been compiled since 2015, since Ohio State won the inaugural national championship, where I ran through the SEC and Clemson. They are 15 and six combined in the playoff. That is magnified by saying that the SEC has only lost to Clemson. All six games are Clemson losses. Clemson has only lost to the SEC. No one from the Pac-12, the Big Ten, or the Big 12 has beaten either entities. So can they claim, can they market all that and say, last five college football players, we're winning these anyway, so we're the ones participating. So do you think it's legit? We think it's legit, and we're going to sell it as legit. Meanwhile, Ohio State clobbering someone from the Pac-12, or maybe if the Pac-12 can't even put sports on the field until January 1st, 2020 anyway, that's been their decision. Who's to say they can get anything together by then anyway? The Big Ten could be playing in a vacuum by themselves. I think it'll be legit. Um, It'll certainly be claimed by everybody, or not everybody, but the majority will be legit because you're still talking, I mean – Eliminating the Big Ten, eliminating Ohio State, basically cut out the middleman. And now it's just, you know, it, it's 
Alabama and Clemson, just as everybody suspected, and there's no longer a mystery. I do think it is interesting. Uh, Pete uh, Thamel is just reporting a few minutes ago that the the proposal now would be to have all fall athletes not have this year count, no matter how many games they play. So that tells you what the NCAA thinks of this year. And, and granted, they don't decide the college football championship, but they don't view this as a legitimate year at all, or else they would not be – in, in line to just uh, give everybody an extra year of eligibility, even if they're playing 10, 11, 12 games this year, which if that happens, I mean, I, I don't know how you could give somebody an, another year of eligibility, but clearly the NCAA views this as a, a, a fake year, basically, if they go through with that ruling. I, I think that that ruling does make sense, however, at least in the preseason, because – uh, Alabama, Clemson, whoever, you know, SEC, ACC could get into the season and they could play six games. And mm -hmm. then you're looking at it and say, okay, well, you played six games, got to ding you for a year. So, and it also uh, protects the Big Ten and the Pac 12 schools who are going to play theoretically a six, seven, eight, nine, 10 game season, whatever it may be in the spring, theoretically on paper as of today. You know, on somebody's uh, legal pad, they've <laughs> scratched out what they, <laughs> what they, I just cracked myself up thinking about this. I mean, my wife was asking me about this. And I'm like, who, in, who's going to care? I, I, th this is like 1995 baseball coming back after they canceled the World Series. I mean, who is going to care? Uh, maybe by the fall when it's real. Uh, it, and people will, and there'll be fans in the stands, and it'll be home games. But this is going to be a TV product at Lucas Oil Stadium. Uh, maybe they'll send the band or just use click effects. Who the hell knows? I mean, it. I, I I'm dumbfounded by the whole idea. I, I'm, I'm. If they're doing this to salvage some last remnant of their television money, which was roughly $54 million a school. Maybe they can salvage $40 million of that. The, the game should do pretty good ratings if you figure uh, their competition is Xavier versus Creighton basketball uh, that nobody watches. I mean, those games get a one on ESPN or Fox Sports 1 or wherever. It has to be like Duke, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. That means something to get a rating in college basketball anymore because they've killed that sport. Uh, pretty much dead at this point. Now, I'm as big a college basketball person as there is, but interest nationally in college basketball is about as low as it could possibly ever be with all the mistakes that they've made, you know, taking a kid like Wiseman who, you know, from Memphis and he can't play because of some arcane, dumb, stupid rule or whatever, you know, his mom and dad took something from Penny Hardaway several years ago when he wasn't even associated working for the school and there was no idea that he would be working for the school is just mind numbingly dumb to me, but I'm off on a completely different tangent. But um, I just, I, I just don't know who is going to care. I mean, maybe a third or half of your fan base will care and watch these games. Uh, who's going to play in them? Certainly not uh, Justin Fields. I mean, is there any chance at all he'd want to play in any of these January, February games. I mean, he's already beaten all these teams like a drum once. What, what does he need to show? It's like Jack Nicholas on the senior tour. What, wh why would I go out there and go to to uh, Danbury, Connecticut, one week and Quad Cities the next when I've already beaten all these guys like a drum for twenty years? Why, why would I go back out there? So. I don't think he has anything left to prove, does he? I, I, I'm confused. So now you're going to have a bunch of freshmen and sophomores running around. But all the way back on that NCAA rule, I'm thumbs up on that, even if they play the full season in the SEC, because the Big Ten could get an eight-game season in the spring, and their guys won't get dinged either for using up a year. And, uh, you know, it's all going to come out in the wash. They're going to have to uh, come up with some kind of one-for-one -one scholarship allowance for people to go over the 85 limit based on guys who would have been gone, but we gave them an extra year, uh, one for one, 
okay, you have seven of those guys. Your limit for this year is 92. Go to it. And I, that's how it's got to be, in my opinion. And if somebody has 95 and somebody has 87, tough crap. I mean, that's just uh, the way of the world uh, in uh, 2021, 2022. I don't like the scholarship rule, but I don't even want to talk about that one right now because I, it's just going to make roster management insane. It's going to make the transfer portal, as I spit here, insane. I just I just think it's really cavalier to have all these people coming out right now, and I understand everybody's pissed and stomping around or whatever. I'm not going to watch this football. Bull crap, you're not going to watch this football. Don't even tell me that. You're absolutely going to consume it with a with a with a side of nachos. You're going to love it. And even if the, some of the top players aren't going to be there, you're going to sit there and see either a whole season from these other three conferences or a partial season from them. And if the Big Ten is able to go there, Ohio State games are going to do a 75 share in Columbus. For Rutgers, I mean, it's gonna, it's going to be insane. I just think it's really cavalier of people to say that they're not going to watch it, and I'm going to give everybody a wide berth for a couple weeks of mourning. But the, it's absolute, it's it's absolutely going to be watched, and we're all going to go and watch Mark's show and complain about the fact that well, I don't understand why we're playing it in January, and Mark's going to get all these viewers and followers, and we're all going to love that. But don't don't tell me for a second nobody's going to be watching. It. That's malarkey. <laughs> wow. Noon did cuss. He said he might, and he totally did. He said the N word. Whoa. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be good. I'm I'm going to a bar after this before, you know, for the hour that I have or whatever before last call because we all can't take care of ourselves, apparently. What, what bar am. are you going to? Well, <laughs> we'll have to talk off the air. <laughs> Is there a format or a model that seems to be more um, be gaining more momentum in terms of spring, winter football? Is it the one that starts in the beginning of January? Which is the one? Is it the Jeff Brown model? Is there one that seems to be gaining I, steam? I, it's it's the January model because that doesn't impact the fall season, and once you start impacting the the subsequent fall season, I think that's a non-starter for a lot of people, and that's not even including the NFL stuff. At least with the January plan, you have nine weeks from like January 1st to February 27th or whatever to play those eight games, and then you play one or two postseason games, and then you've got like four and a half months before camp starts. And I know they, they talk about this load of games on guys, but that's a pretty good break. Now, if somebody tears an ACL, you know, January 24th or whatever, yeah, they're going to, that nine-month time frame to recover from that, you know, that you're probably going to miss some time. But you know, the the idea of starting in like in, in March or something, any later than what Ryan Day and, and some of these models we've seen of January, I just, I don't think, you don't want this impacting everything any more than it already is. And we're already seeing the roster stuff that is going to be coming out. I think you want to get back to normal as quickly as you can. And the January model allows that to happen in re in, in terms of the television product and, and the regular schedules. If you're, you start talking about eight games in, in March through May and then like eight or nine from October to January or whatever, now, you know, that's, I think that's just too much. It's impacting too many things that don't need to be impacted. And you've got Jeff Brom who he threw, threw, threw that model out there and he said, you know, I just did it so people would talk so that we could get the, this process moving. I'm not tied to it. I'm not married to it. And so I, I think there's – football coaches will want to get their teams out there as quickly as possible. And if – I think we all know January is going to be so much easier to do and things are going to be fine in, in January – as opposed to now. So th that's great. And, and as I've said before, testing will be better. Sure. Um, but the virus is still going to be here, but I'm sure by January, it'll be all good. Steve. Okay. I'm looking at the calendar and this is what I would do. They finish up exams, December 7th or 8th, start practice the next day. You practice for about two and a half full weeks on the 23rd of December. Everybody can go home. We'll see you next week. On December the 28th, everybody comes back. They practice that week. They practice the week of January 3rd, 4th. 
and the first game is the weekend of January 9th. The problem that you have if you're using the indoor stadiums is are any of these teams going to be in the playoffs and using their indoor stadium over the weekend of January 9 or 10? But in a perfect world to me, you could start an eight-week season January 9 and 10, and let's just see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It, nine weeks, it'd be done March 6th and 7th. Championship game March 13th, the same day you're playing your Big Ten uh, basketball tournament championship or whatever, and you just tie it up in a nice bow. You don't worry about having spring practice. It was a glorified spring practice. You get them back in the weight room, whatever, and you've minimized. I mean, the bowl game would have only been 10 weeks prior, so you've only gone over by 10 weeks, uh, two and a half months. I don't find that to be uh, to what Tony was saying, too oppressive to the schedule. But have it done by March 13th. If you're going to play a Rose Bowl, you play it the next week, March the 20th, for two teams, and that's it. And then you let everybody rest up, get back in the weight room, la, 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 la. And to me, that's 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 tied it up in a bow, tossed it over my shoulder, and, you know, we've solved the world's problems. Or we could just use the plan that I said, which just starts a week earlier. And then, you know, I mean, but I, I agree. I think the dates work there. I think that you still, I, at this point. Maybe you got to give them time off for Christmas, which would why? screw up. Why? We've had enough time off. <laughs> they, I mean, yeah, they're getting plenty of time off right now. And when they played in, in, in CFP games that were on the 28th, they were getting out there on the 23rd. They could have Christmas every month. Until These they, aren't you know. CFP games. I, again, I think that you start. I, I think that you you got you need to go ASAP. You need to go ASAP. And the the dome stadiums will be in regular season NFL. You're not gonna. You they're not gonna. You they're not gonna I think you play Friday. I think you play. I think you throw a lot of Fridays in here too. Okay. I don't think you need to be. I don't think you need to be in love with with Saturday. And I understand. Well, they're student athletes. They got to go to school. I mean, you know, it's hell. It still could all be mostly distance learning at that point, anyway. I think that you know, I think you have more Thursday and Friday inventory to sit there and, and clear out the stadiums and take that out of the out of the equation because I think that's a very valid point you make there about the stadiums. But you know, that's easily easily addressed by just not being so in love with Saturday at that point. So you have time for transitions and everything else that you need to do at that point. And I mean, let's just face it, the Colts suck. So, I mean, I'm not really concerned about Indianapolis. The thinker put a lot of thought in this one. Justin Fields is selfish, putting his own glory ahead of the health of the American people. Yeah. Justin Fields, nothing else. Uh, he, he is a glory hound for sure. Uh, just wanting to play football so bad and, and not taking everybody else's concerns into account. You're right. Even though uh, today he was on Good Morning America saying, "Hey guys, just maybe don't go partying so much, and you know maybe maybe observe some social distancing, so that he can have his glory." Uh, as Steve already mentioned, he's had his Heisman Trophy robbed from him this year, and now he would just like to play a little bit of football. And of course, that won't happen. And you know now the question becomes, will he play in the winter? And of course, nobody thinks he will, even though you know there would still be time, but. I don't think uh, the, the the agents and attorneys will allow him to do that. They'll drive him off kicking and screaming, but you know, I, I would think if anybody would buck the trend, Justin Fields is the type of guy to do it. But um, it, it, I, I don't see it being uh, with a very high probability of where he would would be that guy. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, the reason we know who Justin Fields is is because he is a football player and therefore he wants to play football. And if anything, he's got less motivation than a lot of other guys. He can sit around for five months, go to the combine, go, you know, select whether he wants to throw at the combine, whatever he wants to do. He's a top five pick in the NFL draft. So he's not the one that's being selfish and leading any kind of charge for this. No, he's and as he said... Million. As he said, he's doing it for teammates and seniors who didn't get their senior year. And so this is definitely not just about him. And I think in just a little bit of time, he's been at Ohio State. Even Ryan Day said he could have been a captain last year, but the rule said sophomores can't do it. So he's been more than just this selfish player where uh, 
you go back to like Terrell Pryor, who didn't have the best reputation while he was at Ohio State, and that's certainly not not been what Justin Fields is. He's been more in line with JT Barrett in terms of and Joe Burrow in terms of how players and teammates feel about him. Ohio State football talk here each and every week. Uh, please subscribe to Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. That way you know when we go live. Uh, we've got schedules that change uh, each and every week uh, that cause the uh, show to float from time to time, typically on Friday, but you never know. Therefore, you need to subscribe. Got Kevin Noon right next to me on top from Buckeye Grove. Please check out his work. Uh, Steve Hellwagon from 247 Sports. Bucknuts. Tony Gerdeman. Buckeye Scoop, uh, answering your questions. Mark, check your facts. Ohio State beat Alabama in the 2014 playoffs. I had really, did they? Did they? Spangler, listen, listen. When I speak, since Ohio State won the inaugural national championship, da, 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 college football playoff. These are the records. Okay. I, I think I'm you know what Mark hopefully you're somebody would kick me right off here if I didn't know that game. 42 35. Got it. Yes, I, I remember it. Typical ESPN guy trying to take a shot at Ohio State like Mark, just always leaving the Buckeyes out in this conversation about the playoffs. I'm sick of it. Absolutely. I'm out of here. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. What else do we have that needs to be addressed in all this business? I just don't see in regards to testing, in regards to the 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 long term effects, anything that's gonna anything that can be proven or that's gonna change between now and December and January. I just think it really comes down to that as being the big all or nothing disclaimer in all this to say what is the Big Ten doing? Well, and we'll see if they're alone. If if the Big Ten and Pac twelve are alone here in the next few weeks and if they are, I'll still always expect, until I see them on the field, I won't expect them necessarily to be 100% playing until like next fall. Like we can, I'm going to preview the heck out of the fall or the winter season. That's what I'm going to do. And I'll throw out some depth charts and then we'll do some previews and we'll talk about it here. But I'll still be waiting, checking. You know my emails and and whatever to hear like oh no it's we're just, we're just not going to be able to make it because practice is going to start in December. You know I'm wondering what happens with basketball. Steve is talking about playing football during March Madness. Basketball practice starts in October. How can they be practicing if football can't? How can they be playing in November if football can't play until January? So what happens with Big Ten and Pac-12 basketball if if they have what 16 18 games it, what kind of what kind of season will that be as they head into march madness or we could it could be may madness next year with if everything gets pushed back and the basketball season gets pushed back so maybe that wouldn't be too bad to have uh, some some basketball later in the year because i think we all agree probably it should start later in the year start once football is over because I don't need to be covering two sports. Granted, I'm not covering any sports right now. I don't need to be covering two sports at the same time. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But I don't know I'm, what happens in November when basketball is supposed to be starting because can you have basketball if you can't have football? Yeah, I think the key, the key to having basketball or having a winter football season um, to me – is the numbers are going to need to go down. And I think what we're going to see on these campuses, as we're seeing at North Carolina, is the numbers are going to go straight up for a while, and then they better go back down and flatten out a little bit and, uh, you know, go from there. So um, I'm not an epidemiologist. I just did one on the Internet. But um, it seems to me that, if they can calm it down and even not necessarily even have the vaccine, but just calm the numbers down to where the risk is infinitesimal. If people take the proper protocols, then, um, you know, we'll see, but college campuses are going to be hot spots, and, um, there's just no way around it. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how, 
you know, those schools that are playing football are going to juggle having guys constantly in and out of the lineup all season long because Nummy on their dorm caught it and now they've got it, you know, and for sharing, you know, a bar of soap or something or whatever. So who knows, but, um, or going to a party or whatever it could be. But, um, you know, it just, uh, we, we are in uncommon times, that is for sure. We are in uncharted territory, and uh, darn it. I mean, I, I would have thought by this point at 52 years old, I would have seen it all, but this just uh, reinforces that uh, it, there's no way you're ever going to possibly see it all because something new is going to happen to change your perspective. And, uh, you know, how are we going to look back on this? It's going to be shaped on how the season goes for those schools. And really, I think for Ohio State, um, you know, you look at 2021 and, um, you know, there's been no talk about that yet. Are they going to flip the Big Ten schedule back to what it was supposed to be this year? That would create a problem with the jigsaw puzzle of the non-conference scheduling because you might have eight home games next year and only six the following year or whatever. You're going to have to start flipping those games too. And and I don't know that they're going to want to do that. So, do they keep the schedule status quo or in that spring season play the schedule that was supposed to be played uh, for 2020? I guess that's what they do, and that's how you get around it. But um, I don't know that Ohio State's top 10 team in 2021 with a brand-new quarterback. So even if he gets to play seven or eight games in the spring, I'm still not sure – with everything they're going to lose off of that team, off of this team, uh, I'm not so sure that, that they're a top 10 or maybe a top five team. I don't know. I guess it depends on how that youth grows up. Like if they roll through everybody in the spring, then you'd have to put them back up there in the fall, provided they did lose somebody uh, who was integral to the, to the progress, uh, a Master Teague or a C.J. Stroud or whoever it may be, you, you can't afford to lose one of those key guys in the spring. But, uh, you know, if they play football, there's always that possibility that, that somebody's lost. And uh, so uh, that's the risk you're going to take if you play uh, in uh, February, January, February, March. Oh, I'll say this, though. And I mean, I'm again, I'm walking up to the line at some point with the politics of this. I think that honestly, if if we're waiting to a point of where the risk is zero, we're never playing again. We're, you know, we're in the genie is out of the bottle. You know, it's just not going to be to that point. I think that there's a big deal in terms of the, the the legal aspect of, you know, what happens if an outbreak happens because of a, a sponsored university sporting event, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're, we're talking about something that has a very low rate in terms of the demographic of 25 years old and, and younger and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it really leads me to the point of what what is it that I mean, what what is the point that we are trying to reach to where people in charge and I use that term loosely are going to be satisfied. What I mean, where do we have to get to on that? What do we have to do to get there? And I don't think any of them know at this point. And if they do, they're probably not being honest about it. So, you know, is is is, is a vaccine around the corner? We you know we've never really had great success with vaccines for the flu before. You know, we we everybody's slapping each other on the back if we have a thirty percent efficacy rate on a, on a flu vaccine. And we're really expecting this to turn around. So, you know, I'm, I'll just I'll end this, you know, kind of this free flow of thoughts with this. I just don't know what's going to be different in January than than is in, in October. And, you know, I, I desperately do want to see Big Ten football this year, even if it is a little bit, quote unquote, watered down in terms of losing some of your star power. I just really can't get behind the decisions being made by the power brokers in the conference of kicking the can down the road to to January or March or wherever it may be. I just, I just think that they have other motives in play here in terms of uh, not being on. All right. Uh, In terms of of what, uh, of, of, of why, you know, why we're delaying. Pardon me. 
Sorry about that. I'm outside and the motorcycle went by. So Okay, just was hoping that they weren't taken off in yours, Steve. No, I okay. don't have one. All right. I don't need my brains to be on the pavement. You know, this has yes. been a terrible day. They've post re really, really postponed the football now. I've I've never used the word postponed in all my coverage. I've just called it straight canceled. And the guy who ran asked uh, did say cancel football. And the one thing Warren did, he said, well, we're not calling it cancel. We're calling it postponed. Like, bleep, bleep that guy. He, you know, he's going to stand on that principle, you know, not, not canceled, postponed, you know, postponed my behind, you know, whatever. Um, just a terrible day. Blue Jackets out of the playoffs, blew a two goal lead with what, five minutes to play, eight minutes to play, whatever it was. That they're done. And then the Reds three hits in the first game of the doubleheader against Kansas City. I was looking forward to this day, spending time with you wonderful people. Uh, you know, a, a Blue Jackets playoff game, two games for the Reds. And this has just turned out to be just another kick in the pants of what's been one long kick of the pants since about March 10th. Uh, I, and, and I know we're all upset, but at least we can find a little bit of joy and happiness in the fact that Kevin Warren will be able to watch his son play college football at Mississippi state this year. So. And we all get to make choices unless you're a big 10 football player. Yeah. That, that's a, a sizable asterisk. Yes. But, you know, clang a clang a clang a good luck to them Bulldogs this year. Pathetic. Yeah, he's going to have plenty of time to uh, catch some games in person. I don't know. He may try and find some youth leagues to cancel, too. <laughs> I hope he takes the Big Ten plane to every game. I hope I hope those presidents are paying for the fuel up the plane and the pilot takes the Big Ten plane to every one of those games. I hope that, I hope that's I hope that's how they handle it. And he'll have a lifetime deal because the only people that can do anything are the presidents and chancellors, and they're all complicit in this. <laughs> exactly. uh, you know, the dog, the, the dog wags the tail, and the tail wags the dog. What a fight well, we've gotten ourselves into. You think about it. The SEC and Clemson are so ingrained in football right now, there's no way they weren't going to play. And Oklahoma and Texas, probably the same thing. There's no way they weren't going to play. This just – this just tells the world that the Big Ten values football in a different light, and it shouldn't be like this. And I know I'm speaking like a Cro Magnon person, I guess, but you know me, me like I'm football or whatever. <laughs> but I, well, you well, know, I, I, I just think that that you know, as as Nicholson said in in a few good men, you've weakened a country today, and and that's so true. I mean it. This is going to hurt, and this is going to sting for a long time. It took Woody Hayes seven years to get over that Rose Bowl thing in 1961 uh, before he, you know, kids left. They didn't come to Ohio State because you couldn't. You there was no guarantee you were going to go to a, to the Rose Bowl. Now, I think cooler heads have propelled. They they got a top 100 kid from Kansas, a running back, uh, Desan McCullough, here just this week uh, for 2022. So they're still recruiting blue chip players, but uh, I'm sorry, linebacker. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, just uh, his dad's the running backs coach. That's why I had it in my head. Um, you know, they're still able to recruit players, but how I think for some of these Big Ten programs, they're just going to continue their descent into the abyss. And I think for the ones like Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan that are trying to compete at the highest level, it's going to be that much harder to do that, I think. But at least we'll have a gentleman's agreement. I mean, it's fantastic. We can just go back to that 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 milk toast. Well, you know, we're just all out here for a fine constitutional, and hopefully nobody gets hurt. And you know, look at this beautiful grass out here, and the sun is shining. And and you know, it took Urban Meyer to come in here and and you know flip over some tables and kick some chairs in or whatnot. And the league was finally on its right uptick. And then we bring in this joker, Kevin Warren, who sits there and stullies it all. Urban Meyer for Big Ten Commissioner. Or college yeah. football commissioner, you know, one or the other. He is responsible for so many Big Ten programs 
elevating themselves, not just Ohio State. So, yeah, he, he brought the Big Ten up by its bootstraps and brought them into modern football. And it's, yeah, if that's what it takes, and it might have to re- require something else like that after this whole debacle is done. True. Uh, the, the football was, was really good at certain times, but certainly um, was beaten down by the SEC in particular just prior to Urban Meyer's uh, arrival. But uh, Steve touched on, on a point regarding just kind of the Big Ten's approach to all of this uh, balance of, of, of typically academics. Now it's more social issues and this medical pandemic and football. I, I would say down through the years, it's been pretty effective. They have maintained uh, a high standard of, of academics and usually take the high road in regards to we're siding with the academics or in this case, again, some complex level of social issues of over just being football factories or sports factories. But they botched this one. The, I, I don't think there's any question about it. And they just have to hope that there's no fall season. Uh, we got one football question that came in because it may relate directly to to what we're going to see starting in January, I guess. That would be, if there's no Justin Fields, how does the quarterback battle look for 2021? Well, Three have, true freshmen. Go ahead, Kevin. If they have an opportunity to do something, I think that C.J. Stroud probably works his way up to the top of the list. I mean, Gunnar Hoke has the most experience in terms of his time at Kentucky, and he's had a year uh, in the program at Ohio State as, as the third stringer. He wasn't able to uh, beat out Chris Chuginoff last season. Um, you know, if, if they're if they're tabled for a long time and Ohio State isn't able to do a lot, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, Gunnar Hoke may have a little – he'll have an edge, but I think that if we're looking at where we would be in a 21 season that – you know, it would be a good battle between C.J. Stroud and Jack Miller. Uh, you know, I, I hate, you know, picking one or the other without seeing them really do anything in terms of practice. We only got through three spring ball practices, and they put the quarterbacks in the next county. Um, but, you know, if you held a gun to my head on that, I would say C.J. probably would be the guy that I would say that would have the edge. And wouldn't you side, wouldn't you put the true freshman in there anyway for the winter season in preparation for the actual fall season then? I go, do you really no good to go with Gunnar Hoke unless you really valued this whole eight games or whatever? And sure, they do want to win, but you get C.J. Stroud or whatever, seven games under his belt, and then it's time for Michigan. I think maybe that's what they would do. But I'm like Kevin. I don't – everybody is, is throwing their – assuming it's going to be C.J. Stroud – it very well may be. I just would still like to see Jack Miller do something. And then, of course, it's Kyle, Kyle McCord is the, the true, true freshman, along with the two, two freshmen. So there's going to be three true freshmen there battling it out with Gunnar Hoke. And I know the, the there, are some, there are some who will tell you, like, don't forget about Kyle McCord, who might be more talented than any of the others. I think it's going to ask, be – I don't think anybody can do – I don't think a freshman can come in this winter and do it because they're going to be graduating early. And usually they arrive the first week of January, which is when the games would be played. So he would have to move to Columbus, practice, do high school remotely, and, and then win the job. So that won't happen. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to give up on Jack Miller just yet. Let me, let me see what he can do in practice. Not that we will ever be able to watch another practice again at Ohio State as long as we live. <laughs> Well, hell, I'm probably never going to get invited to another Big Ten event with, with all my with my 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 roaring uh, support of of leadership in the conference. Right? Hey, hey, if they penalize all the media people who've been critical of how they've handled this, they would have nobody on press row because <laughs> everyone has been united in their uh, disdain for how this has gone. I can't I can't find anybody except for Woken and uh, Nicole Arbach and. Uh, 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 Stewie, who've you know fallen in line with this because, well, the Mel maybe the four of them can sit courtside for the Big Ten tournament, and everybody else can can watch from the parking lot. I guess I was gonna say I'll I'll see you over there at uh, either San Elmo or the um, what's the bar with the uh, Long Island iced teas and the pretzels, Kilroy's. Kilroy's. <laughs> you know. Um, 
speaking of getting to watch practice, with it being basically an exhibition season in the spring, they don't have any reason to not allow people. They're going to need people to cover the team to generate interest to get people to watch it because it's outside your regular viewing pattern to watch college football in March or February. And, um, you know, if they're allowed to sell any tickets either, which, you know, maybe somebody would be crazy enough to buy tickets to drive to Indianapolis to watch them play. Somebody on here asked, are they going to play their home games in Indianapolis? There's no plan. Nobody knows where they're playing or who they're playing. You know, are they going to use the Dome in St. Louis? Uh, Pat Murphy, who works with us, said he read they may use domes in Dallas and Houston, of all places, uh, to play some Big Ten games, believe it or not. So um, I guess Atlanta would be viable, too. I don't know. but um, There's a dome in Iowa as well, northern Iowa. That'd be perfect if you can't uh, have fans. That'd be perfect. So that arena team used to play up there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so you and I, the football team, plays there as well. But we can go to the oh, North Dakota, right. whatever Bison Dome or whatever. Yeah. Aye, 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 guys. Thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Uh, this is Ohio State football talk each and every week. It gets no better than this. Kevin Noon from Rivals Buckeye Grove. He is an opinion or two once in a while. We try to drag it out of him. Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Scoop, just below me. And, of course, Steve Hellwagon, who's gracious enough to post these videos on Bucknuts on 247 Sports. BGPO Football Funk. I got it right this time. BGPO Football Funk. That actually stands for black and gold, purple and orange. Steelers Clemson fan. There's a lot of those out there. Um Two Super Chats. Thank you so much, uh, DeAndre, for that. We appreciate it greatly, even though you um, have some kind of uh, carpal tunnel that forces you to constantly type 4-0 for some reason. Uh, anyway, regardless, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining you guys. Kevin, Tony, Steve, these guys are phenomenal. They're the best in Ohio State football coverage, and we thank all of you for your time. See you next week. See you. Mm-hmm.